All right, so today I want to show you some of the ball pythons in my collection here in my reptile room. Give me a quick little tour of the room and kind of show you where I'm at in the ball python breeding season. I've actually had a lot of people on my live stream say, hey, can we actually see some of your snakes? And yes, I can definitely show you some of my ball pythons here in my collection. I'm actually right in the middle of the breeding season. So just a couple weeks ago, I separated my males and my females. I was pairing them up for about five months. You actually cycle your males through the females. And right now I'm just waiting on my females to lay eggs. I don't have any eggs yet this season. It's kind of like the anticipation is definitely building here in my reptile room. I have my incubator plugged in, ready to go. And I'm checking all the tubs every single day, just waiting for these females to drop. I'm actually breeding 23 females this year, which is quite a few for my pretty small collection here. As a matter of fact, I've been breeding ball pythons for I'd say about six years now and every year I produce anywhere from like 50 to about a hundred ball python hatchlings not a whole lot compared to some of the really big breeders but let me tell you it is a handful once I get like a hundred hatchlings on top of the other 40 plus snakes that I have here in my collection so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go around kind of give you a quick tour of the room open some tubs and just kind of hang out for a little bit give you an update on my ball python breeding season all right, so if you haven't seen my reptile room before, you can actually be kind of deceived. It looks a lot bigger than it actually is. So here is a whole bunch of racks for ball pythons. And they're, the, the racks are different sizes for different sizes of ball pythons. So these are all my grow outs over here and my males. I actually have a couple small females in this rack. And then over here is a hatchling rack. This is where all my adult females live on the top. And then I have some really big female ball pythons over there. Have another hatchling rack over here here and then I have some random stuff over in the corner I actually have these papaya plants that I planted from seed just kind of something interesting they seem like they're doing really good down here in the reptile room I was actually thinking maybe as a matter of fact I actually planted four of these and I ended up I think with four females so I don't think I'm going to get any papayas from those I definitely need a male so I think I'm actually going to give those away to someone who lives down south in more of a tropical climate they can actually plant them outside and then I have my roaches down here and then I have my tarantula this is Beetlejuice and she is a Brazilian giant white knee tarantula and then over here I actually have my humidification system it's like a big swamp cooler that keeps the humidity just perfect I actually have it set up over here on a digital control I can control the humidity to almost anything I want here in my reptile room right now I have it set at 52 percent and someone's actually actually asking me the temperatures in here so for the ambient temperature i keep it between i'd say about 77 to like a low 80 like in maybe 80 82 degrees as far as the ambient temperature then my hot spots i have them all set at 90 degrees and kind of the interesting thing is if you actually look at all these racks in here it seems like it's a really big room but let me tell you it's definitely deceiving this room is like less than 200 feet as a matter of fact i was just doing this the other day if you actually take one of these tubs and open it up and i hang on to this tub and i come all the way over here i can actually touch that tub and touch this rack at the same time just by by stretching my arms out so it's not that big of a room which is pretty amazing I have all this stuff crammed in here pretty much from floor to ceiling I was actually thinking if I move some of this stuff out I could actually move the, you know all this stuff out and move other racks in here maybe another like uh, as a matter of fact this this hatchling rack right here I haven't really used it since I started selling on morph market so I pretty much hatch out some snakes I put them in this rack and last year I I'd fill this rack halfway up then I get to about halfway and then I hatch out some more snakes and then I'd sell the snakes that I had you know after they had a few meals before I'd actually completely fill that rack so the way I'm selling them I really don't even need this. I don't even know if I'm going to use this it's actually an ARS 1065 with 65 tubs in it so potentially I can actually move that out and move in like another breeder rack or something like that but I'm not sure if I want to do that and expand my collection, this is <laughs> this is pretty much a lot of work right here, especially when everything's like in full swing and I'm getting eggs and hatchlings and everything else. 
So what I want to do is I want to show you, I want to start with some of these, uh, some of my grow outs. I actually held back two from last year. These are the ones I hatched out last year. And take a look at this one. This is Sparky. Sparky is a pinstripe coral glow. Look at how awesome Sparky is. Sparky is a male and a male maker, which is kind of the frustrating part of the Coral Glow project. So if I breathe this to something else, half the offspring come out as Coral Glow, and every single Coral Glow or Coral Glow combination will all be males. I won't get any females from that combination, which is kind of crazy. And working with Coral Glows and Bananas. As a matter of fact, this year, I'm breeding a banana. I bought a banana Enchi Clown. I'm breeding that through my collection. And that banana is a male maker too. So it'll be pretty slim. I think it's like one in a hundred chances that I'll actually get a female from my bananas or my Coral Glows. And I've been, I've been really taming this guy down. Every time I clean his tub, I've been picking him up and holding him and it seems like he's getting really tame seems like he was really kind of snappy early on look at how big and chunky he's getting he's pretty much uh just transitioning away from mice i'm still feeding him mice and kind of switching over to rats as a matter of fact uh i've been feeding him like i have a, a, pretty much a lot of frozen thawed because uh, I have a, a couple of freezers that are completely full of of all these rats and mice that i've been breeding and just all the extra so take a look at this guy. This is Pookie. Pookie is going into a deep shed. Look at how, <laughs> how gray his eyes are really super grayed out. This is actually Bobby's grandchild. So Bobby is the bamboo, the, the ball python that I have around my snake at the beginning of every video. And this is uh, his, his offspring's offspring. So it would be his grandchild. So this one is actually a pretty powerful combination. This actually is a bamboo, pastel, pinstripe, caligo, possible hat desert ghost on this one. So the, the parent on this one was 50% hat desert ghost. So this is, assuming that one proves out, this could possibly be a desert ghost. Pretty awesome pattern on this one. Really looking forward to breeding this one. Maybe in the fall. I'm not sure if it'll actually be ready by the fall since it's just going to be one year old. I might wait one more year on this one to actually breed it through my collection, but that is going to be a pretty powerful breeder. And then if you actually look at this rack over here, speaking of Bobby, I can show you where Bobby lives. Everyone's like, where does Bobby live in all these tubs? I actually put them right in the middle of this rack that is that contains all my females. And he's the only male in this whole rack. And it's just because I had him in a smaller tub. I had him in a like a 50-40 tub, like the, where, where those hatchlings were. And he definitely outgrew it. And then I put him in this tub. And this tub, this is like an ARS 70 series tub, pretty much uh, a tub for uh, an adult ball python for its entire life. You really don't want to start with a hatchling in a tub like this. Although uh, you, technically you could, if you put some kind of dividers or maybe like built up the coconut husk substrate all around, just kind of put them in a little spot in the back. But, but normally you actually move them up through the different sizes. And then finally you get to this size for an adult. And I've actually have, so I actually have some females that are way bigger than, than this tub. That as a matter of fact, uh, I can show you one down here that she is a really big female that is just she looks really super small in a tub like that that is uh let's see this is my biggest snake in my entire collection right here and she is grabbing full of eggs look at how big she is she's just a normal 100% het caramel albino and look at how big she is she's I'd say she's probably about 5,500 grams or something like that. And she usually lays about 13 eggs. And this year I actually bred my bamboo lesser to this girl. So if she lays eggs, which I think she will, half of them will be bamboos, half of them will be lessers, which is pretty awesome. And then down here I can show you this one too. I think this girl's gonna go first out of all the snakes in my collection. She is really big. And it's funny on this one, she was, she was fasting for a really long time, we got super, super skinny and then just decided to start pounding the rats right when I started pairing her up. 
And I haven't fed her in, uh, it's probably been, as a matter of fact, we can actually look at the card here. It's been since January <laughs> since she ate, and it's already April, and look at how big she is. She hasn't been eating since January. She's definitely full of eggs. That's, that's not fat from eating too much. She's definitely gonna lay eggs. And this one, I'd say, probably will be the first female in my collection. I go through all of them every single day. But I think that one's gonna be the first one to go. And then right in the middle, I actually have my reticulated python. This is Sunny. Ooh, Sunny drank a bunch of water since yesterday. I need to fill that up. But yeah, I check, I check every single snake every single day. And it's funny, this is my male reticulated python that I was breeding to Lucy for a while. And then, uh, he he kept fasting for a really long, I think he didn't eat for like five months, which is kind of crazy. And then just recently he came back on food and I was actually feeding him like four times a week. These really big humongous rats, he was just like plowing them down. He got a lot of really good body condition from eating. And then he went back off of food again. He hasn't eaten for a while, which is kind of crazy. I just tried to offer him a rat yesterday and he turned up his nose at it. And sometimes these snakes, they'll go for a really long time time without eating and then sometimes they'll just really devour the rodents and if they fast for a really long time and get really super skinny and they go back on food I usually increase the frequency especially with a big snake like this she he can really eat a lot of food back to back and kind of burn up all my retired breeder rats that's what I bought them for is to use up all my rats from my breeding operation so then I have one more hatchling from last year. I can actually show you this one that uh, someone was making payments on, and then I don't know. It kind of got, it kind of got, kind of got, kinda got to the point of year where it was just so cold outside. I didn't really want to ship, and I wasn't really in a hurry to to ship this guy out. This is actually Joker, my pastel calico. And yeah, last year was the first time I really isolated my my version of calico. And this guy, I don't know if I want to pick him up. I just fed him a really huge frozen thawed mouse, really <laughs> super big. That guy is getting really big, which is pretty crazy. Looking really good. That's the first time I really made some really awesome calico combinations here in my collection. And then, let's see, another one I actually have here that I'm really excited about. This one's pretty awesome. This is one of Bobby's offspring. I bred Bobby to a lemon blast and produced this one. This is actually a bamboo pastel pinstripe. Look at how beautiful it is. Like a real, almost like a silvery metallic color which is pretty awesome. And this is a female, and I tried to breed her this year. I don't know if she's gonna go or not. She's, she's like right in the edge of about 1,500 grams, and I was wondering if she was gonna go. She might not go this year. I'm hoping she'll go next year. I don't know, she's, she's got some pretty good body condition, and she was eating pretty good. So that would be pretty awesome if I could actually breed this one. So this one, I'm actually breeding to my banana Enchi clown. So if she does lay eggs this year, I would get a banana Enchi bamboo pastel pinstripe, 100% head clown and possible head desert coast on that. If, uh, I'd definitely hold back one of the offspring if I got something from that one. That one's a really exciting project, which is pretty awesome. So this is the one I'm actually breeding to that one. This is my banana inchy clown. Look at how beautiful this one is. Getting really big too. I actually tried to breed this one last year at about 500 grams and he was way too small. I didn't get any offspring. I think I just bred him too small. And it seems like the older he gets cut, the more he kind of fades out a little bit when he was younger. He had a lot of definition in this banana inchy clown. And it seems like a lot of the clown combinations are really intense with a lot of high definition as hatchlings. And then when they age and mature, it seems like a lot of times they'll really fade out. But you know, being a male and he's about uh, two years old, so not too bad as far as uh, the size. A lot of people like to keep their males a lot smaller than a lot of the females. Uh, if they're too small, sometimes they won't be, and if they're too big, sometimes they can get really lazy too. 
So let's see what else I have. So I actually have this male calico bamboo. A lot of people have asked, hey, can I see your male, your bamboo calico? And look what calico does to the bamboo. Really brings in a lot of white, which is kind of crazy. And on this particular combination, you can actually see a lot of gray, like almost like this gray stripe coming in the side of this one. And this one's been a really good breeder. So this calico actually came from my pastel calico female, which just last year we proved out that was 100% had desert ghost. So this one technically is possible. Uh, this one's actually, well, this one would actually be 50% had desert ghost because we proved out that female is 100%. So this one I've been breeding through my collection. It'd be interesting to actually prove this out to see if there's desert ghost in this one, which would be pretty awesome because then everyone, everything else would actually be uh, increased as far as the percentage of the desert ghost. Sometimes you work these genes through your collection and they kind of get more and more diluted as you go. Sometimes it can be... Uh, Kind of frustrating, you know, you never know what you have in a lot of your, your snakes until you, know, you kind of accidentally prove something out. You know, you it's possible to head desert ghost. Speaking of desert ghosts, take a look at this one. This is my male pastel inchy desert ghost. Pretty awesome. This is where a lot of my desert ghost is actually coming from, from this male breeding this through my collection. So this one actually bred to that female pastel calico last year. And I just randomly produced a visual desert ghost. I was like, what in the world did I produce? I had no clue that that was actually het desert ghost. And I produced a really awesome, uh, it was either a pastel or a super pastel desert ghost from that combination, which is kind of crazy. And let's see, this one's kind of interesting too. If you're wondering what a mature coral glow looks like, this is where all my coral glows came from. I actually bought this one as a hatchling when it was really small. And this is what happens when they age and mature. They, they kind of turn into this kind of like a two-tone, kind of a yellowish orange color and they develop all these little freckles all over the place. And this one, of course, is a male maker, produced all my male corgos. Every single year I get all males, and all those males are male makers because they're all coming from a male. So if you actually have a female, that lay, the female corglo that lays eggs, and you end up with a male, that male will actually be a female maker and produce all females. It's kind of a weird anomaly with the male makers and the female makers. So there's so much in here, I could just go on for hours and hours. <laughs> Another thing I wanted to show you right at the end here, I kind of show you this right and this last thing. These things, they've been they've been on a, a hunger strike. These are my triple heads, albino pied clown triple heads. So I actually took my albino pied, which is a visual, I bred it to a clown and I produced a whole bunch of these. So they look like normal ball pythons, but they contain one copy of each of the three recessive genes. And I was really hoping to get these a little bit bigger. Uh, these are actually from, I think these are coming up on two years old now. So they kind of hit the like the thousand gram wall. I think they're probably like 1200 or 1300 grams right on the edge of being a little bit too small to breed. I think I'm gonna wait one more year on these guys, but that would be pretty awesome to breed these. So I have two females and one male triple hat. So when I breed these, I'll produce uh, albinos, I'll produce pies, I'll produce clowns. Albino pies, albino clowns, clown pies, and albino pie clowns. I'll produce a whole bunch, like a whole rainbow of different snakes from these, which is pretty awesome. So this one is, uh, this one's my male. My all my males and my females all went off of food. As a matter of fact, just about all my snakes right now are all off of food, which it seems like this time of year in the breeding season, a lot of my snakes always go off of food. And here's one of my females, pretty much all just about the same size. It's kind of interesting, you can see kind of a pattern reduction. And in some cases, like in this one, you see it's a little bit brighter than you'd see in a normal ball python. This is another triple head, albino pied clown. And I think the, the brightness in this particular snake is actually coming from the clown 
which a lot of people say the het clowns can be a little brighter than your normals, which is kind of interesting. This is the first time I've really seen it. And a lot of people say that the the, the het pies can really kind of jumble up the pattern. I think that's where a lot of the pattern enhancing, kind of jumbling up the pattern just a little bit in some spots. I think it's coming from the het pies. But it's kind of interesting. You can almost kind of see a slight effect from the triple heads. I don't think there's any kind of a, a visual marker for the head albino as far as anything like that. So that is pretty much my collection. Uh, if you've been watching my live stream, if you're wondering where Bubble lives, Bubble is my pinstripe female. She's, I, I don't think she's gonna lay eggs because she's actually still eating rodents. As a matter of fact, she just ate another rodent this week. One of my only snakes that ate. So I don't think she's gonna lay. But next year, I think this one will definitely lay. Look at how big and chunky she is. And I would say, if she wasn't eating really good, I'd say she looks like she's gonna lay some eggs. If she does lay, it'll probably be really late in the season, but usually, you know, at this point in the year, if you still have a snake that's that's eating when other ones are like ready to lay eggs, I don't think she's actually gonna go. Usually they stop eating for like a, at least a couple months before they lay eggs. So that's pretty much it. You know, I could just go on and on and on. We can have, you know, like a like a two hour video with all these stuffs. I have a lot of really cool snakes in here. As a matter of fact, about two weeks ago, I produced a video and I went through every single snake. You might want to go back and check that one out if you want to see all my snakes in my entire collection. So that is pretty much it. Thanks for hanging out with me today here in my reptile room. And I will see you in the next video.